Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. Jim's over here with you. Glad you're with us. Here's our contact information. A Word from the Lord at gmail.com, 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me. And uh, we've been getting some good uh, discussion on our emails, and uh, we're glad that you're out watching. Individuals who are watching on YouTube or watching live, if you're in the area and you would like to come study the Bible with us, 250 Boulevard is where we're meeting uh, on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. And Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. And we'd like to see you there. We'd like to meet you. And if you've been watching the program for a long time, we're wondering why you haven't come out and visited with us. And a lot of times people watch the programs and we love the program, like, uh, like the teaching. You're teaching, uh, making sense, and the only one's making sense, that sort of thing. But we never see you. And so it makes us wonder, you know, just how much you're uh, really appreciating what we're doing. We don't want to work together. We want to do great things in the kingdom for the Lord. But uh, we can't do that if we don't know you. So we'd like to see you uh, come out and visit with us and uh, let us get to know you and uh, take us up on the opportunity to study the Bible anytime you, anytime you can. Uh, we'd love to study the Bible. As a matter of fact, just this uh, week, I was just the other day, yesterday, I was uh, talking to a man. He's a member of the Jehovah's Witness, and he... Uh, says he'd like to study, but he wants one of his elders with him. And I said, well, I'd be glad to study with you and one of your elders. And uh, I said, but I'm betting he won't study with you and me. And he said, well, if he won't, it seems like he's got something to hide. And I said, I agree with you. But, you know, uh, as far as him contacting the elder or getting the elder or actually wanting to do it any further than that, he won't. So I wonder if he, if maybe he has something to hide. But anyway... We want to study with you, and if you're really interested in studying God's Word, <clears throat> we'll be glad to come out and study with you, or you can uh, assemble with us and study God's Word together. You know, one of the keys to learning is repetition. And sometimes you might be thinking, well, you know, y'all always harping on the same thing. You're t covering the same subject time and time and time again. But, you know, sometimes it takes repetition to help teach people some things. How many times did Jesus teach the same thing over and over and over before the people ever got it. And in some cases, cases, they never got it. I mean, he spent three years talking about the kingdom. And actually then, after his resurrection, he spent 40 more days talking about the kingdom. And right before he ascended into heaven, they said, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel this time? They still didn't understand the nature of the kingdom fully and completely. And so... Sometimes it just takes some repetition and sometimes it takes uh, going over things a little different ways in order to uh, get, get it to click. And uh, for example, in Matthew 14, in Matthew 14, Jesus fed a multitude, 5,000 I believe it was, uh, with a few loaves and a few fishes. Then in Matthew 15, he feeds another multitude with uh, uh, seven fishes and a few loaves, I believe it was. And then Matthew 16, he says, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And his disciples said, Oh, he's mad at us because we forgot bread. Did you not just remember that he fed 5,000, he fed 4,000, and now you're worried about bread again? And it's like you can see how even our Lord was like, Man, you know, y'all just wrapped up in bread. So why is it that you're not getting it? Well, sometimes that's okay. I mean, sometimes that's what it takes to, to uh, uh, teach teaching the same things over and over. And so we want to be sure that we're giving everybody the chance they need to learn the truth or hear the truth as many times as it takes. Now, <clears throat> in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 24, Paul said, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle uh, to all men apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. So sometimes it's the case that you know, people are, are caught up in a doctrine or believe that they've been taught all their life, and so you have to just be patient with them and try to get them out of it. If they're moving, if they're gradually coming out of it, if they're moving along, then you just keep working with them, trying to get it out of it. And that's the case tonight. Tonight, uh, actually going to uh, discuss some things that uh, we've discussed before. Last month, I uh, did a lesson from some emails that I got, and so the... the the emailer, the viewer, is, is writing back in, asking us, asking more questions about some of the same things. So what are we going to do? We're going to go over it again. And you might say, well, James, you know, we've heard this before. 
I don't want to hear it again. Well, you don't complain when the same song comes on the radio, do you? I mean, if it's God's word and it's truth, you don't complain about that. So uh, you shouldn't complain about that. So let's go over some things about, first of all, the gospel. Because the, the, the writer, the viewer, is asking questions about the gospel and about baptism. So tonight, we're going to do a little re, uh, brief uh, review of the gospel, how the gospel was not uh, a certain gospel to the Gentiles and a certain gospel to, the, to the, the Jews. We're going to talk about the singularity of the gospel just for a little bit. And then we're going to go into how the gospel that Paul preached was indeed, had indeed had something to do with baptism for the remission of sins. In, Acts 3, in Galatians 3 verse 8, we see that God's plan was always about preaching the gospel, notice singularly. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, notice the singularity here. Abraham heard the gospel. Now, Abraham was the father of the Jews. But the Bible says that God was going to justify the heathen or the Gentiles as well through faith. Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So the way God was going to justify the heathen was through the gospel that he tells the father of the Jews about. What does that mean? That means that Jew and Gentiles were going to get be the, blessed by the same thing. That is, in, in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Jesus Christ was going to be the seed of Abraham that will bless all nations. And so it was in, in a Christ that all nations, Jew and Gentiles, were going to be blessed. Now, there wasn't ever in God's mind, well, one gospel is going to go over here to the Jews and one gospel is going to go over here to the Gentiles. No, friends. That was never the case. That was never in God's mind. God didn't even think about it. He didn't even have a bad dream about it. All right? He knew in his mind he was going to preach the gospel that was going to save Jew and Gentile alike. And so that was always God's plan. Now, when someone comes along and says, well, Peter and Paul, they preached two different gospels. Well, here's the problem with that, friends. The problem with that is if you study, if you study the Bible, just even do a little cursory glance on it, you'll start soon realizing that Peter and Paul both went to the same people. They both went to the Jews and they both went to the Gentiles. Now, if they both went to the Jews and they both went to the Gentiles, how is it that they're then preaching two different gospels, one for the Jew and one for the Gentile? And what do you do if there's a mixed, if there's a mixed company, see? In Acts 2, verse 38, we have Peter on the day of Pentecost, and we all know uh, who was there. Acts 2, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Acts 2, in verse uh, uh, 5, the Bible says, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So here are the Jews, and Peter's preaching the first gospel sermon to them, and he tells them what? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38. But he's preaching to Jews. But notice now in Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 15, he comes along and at this, at this council, at this, at this get together where they're having to discuss the gospel, if you will, about what is required of Gentiles to, to be obedient to God. At this, at this uh, setting, here comes Peter along and he says, uh, men and brethren, a good while ago, you know how a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the gospel, the word of the gospel, and believe. He didn't say anything about hearing the word of the gospel to the Gentiles and believe. He just said the word of the gospel. Now, friends, you really have to have help to, to believe that there's a different gospel for the Gentiles than a different gospel for the Jews. It's just not in the Bible. It's just foreign to the Bible. Uh, God didn't even think about it. And then you have Paul, Paul going to the Jews and to the Gentiles as well. Notice in Acts 13, Acts 13 and verse uh, 44, the next Sabbath day uh, came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. And when the Jews uh, saw the multitudes, were filled, they were filled with envy and uh, spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken unto you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves worthy, unworthy of everlasting life, lo, 
we turn to the Gentiles. Now, why would he say, I'm going to go to the Gentiles? Why would that make the Jews envious? Why didn't he say, well, since you don't believe your gospel, I'm going to turn over to the Gentiles and preach their gospel to them? Why would that bother them? They would just, why didn't the Jews go, well, good, good rid of us. We don't want you, we don't want you talking to us. You just go over to the Gentiles. But no, he said, I'm going to tell you, I'm telling you first, the gospel that's going to save, that can save you, but yet you don't want to hear, so I'm going to turn to the Gentiles. Well, why? Because it was the same gospel. It was the same gospel. And so uh, this is what we're talking about. Even to the same people, Peter and Paul both went to the Jew and Gentiles, but they even went to the same people. Now, I know we've, we've talked about this before, but I just want to cover it one more time quickly. Notice this, Galatians 1 and verse 2, and we're going to add one more uh, nail to this coffin. Galatians 1 and verse 2, look who Paul's writing to. And, the, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Here's Paul writing, and he says, the churches of Galatia. <clears throat> now, someone might say, well, James, Paul went to the Gentiles. And so he's writing to the Gentile churches of Galatia. Okay, well, if you want to think that, that's fine. That's fine. But notice this. Peter writes to the same people. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Here's Peter writing. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and, and Bithynia. Now here's Peter writing to the, the, the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, uh, Galatia. Now, again, someone says, what's well, James? Peter is writing to the Jews who were scattered in Galatia, and Paul was writing to the Gentiles who were in Galatia. So they got two different Gospels going on. Well, really? You want to hold on to that? Because I want to show you how the Bible will just knock this doctrine right in the head. I'm talking about just stone cold knock them out. If Peter and Paul are writing to two different people, and they're telling two different Gospels, then why does Peter say this? Look at 2 Peter 3 and verse, 8, verse 15. And the account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, who according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Now here is Paul writing to the same people that Peter's writing to. Now, if Peter has got a gospel to the Jews and Paul's got the gospel to the Gentiles, why is it that Paul is writing to these folks? Why are they writing to the same people? And why didn't Peter say to these folks, now, here's, here's Brother Paul over here, he's writing to you, but you know what? You, you know you're Jews because I'm writing to you. You know, Peter writes just to the Jews. That's what they say. Now, if Paul's writing to them, why didn't he say, y'all just need to ignore what Paul says because Paul's teaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And y'all don't have any business listening to Paul because y'all are Jews, so you just don't need to worry about that. But here he's saying no. He says, look, Paul is writing unto you, and Peter even says in the very next verse, he calls it Scripture. He says, some people rest what Paul says, they twist what Paul says as they do other things. Scriptures, which means that what Paul's writing is Scripture. Friends, Peter and Paul wrote to the same people. And they didn't conflict, they didn't contradict each other because they spoke the same gospel. They spoke the same gospel. Now, someone says, well, James, what about, what about Galatians 2, verse 7? Galatians 2, verse 7. I think I'm, going, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, maybe. But I just want to pull this up. Galatians 2, verse 7. Contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the circum uncircumcision was committed to me, as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter. So I said, well, see, there's two different gospels. No, that's not two different gospels. He's just pointing out that primarily Paul had been going to the Gentiles with the same gospel as Peter was going primarily to the Jews. But it was still the same gospel. It wasn't two different gospels. The problem was, these people had a mix-up about what Gentiles had to do to be saved. And that's why they thought that Paul should be preaching something different. My friends, Peter and Paul were speaking the same thing to the same group of people. And here we're going to show you that more and more. Because if Peter and Paul were speaking different Gospels, if they were preaching different Gospels, then why would they go to, 
to the, the same groups. You know, why would they go to the other groups? Why would Paul go over here to the Jews and why would Peter go over to the Gentiles? You see, why didn't, Paul, why didn't God just send for a Gentile Christian to go and teach, teach uh, uh, Cornelius? Right? See, why, why, send, why send Peter to talk to any Gentiles and not send Paul? And as a matter of fact, Paul was, was a Jew too, so why was he preaching uh, to the Gentiles? All right? Why not have a Gentile apostle over here and let him go to the Gentiles? See, so many, so many problems with this two gospel business. But now, here is what, here is what the viewer is asking. Here's the question the viewer asks. Let's say Paul called the gospel my gospel. All right, I, I don't know that. That's just, uh, just an excerpt from their, uh, uh, their email here. But it says Paul said the gospel was my gospel. Paul called the gospel. My gospel. The gospel of Paul is my gospel. That's what they say. And, and true, he does say my gospel. He does say my gospel. Let's look at Romans 16.25 just to be fair in dealing with the scripture here. Now to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of mystery which was kept secret until, uh, since the world began. All right, yeah, Paul calls it my gospel. He says it's my gospel. That's not a problem. I don't have a problem with that at all. But there, you understand, why would he call it my gospel? Why would he call it my gospel? Here's why he calls it my gospel. It's not, it's not because Paul had an exclusive gospel that was only his and was not Peter's and was not John's and was not Mark's or whoever. He, had, he said it was my gospel because it was one that he was preaching because it was committed to him. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 11, he says, According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, who was which was committed to my trust. So God committed the glorious gospel. Notice, the gospel. Not a gospel, but the gospel to him. He was committed to it. It was committed to his trust. And that's why he says it's my gospel. That's why he says it's my gospel. Uh... But here's, here's something else. There's a reason why Paul says it's my gospel. See, friends, if, you don't, if you're not aware of the context of the Bible, then you'll start reading into some things like, well, Paul had a gospel. It was only his, and therefore he had the gospel to the Gentiles, and everybody else had the gospel to the Jews, and, and that's why there's two different gospels here. You've got to understand the context. Paul said that's my gospel, because he was saying as opposed to false teachers' gospels. Look at this. In Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9, what is Paul warning about? See, all during the New Testament times, they didn't have the Bible. They didn't have the New Testament written down. So if someone came in teaching a false doctrine, the, the, the person in the pew, all right, the Christian there, Joe Christian, he couldn't just open up the Bible and say, no, 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 wait a minute now. You're teaching false doctrine because that is not what Paul said in the book of Romans. He couldn't go to the book of Ephesians and say, well, wait a minute now. That contradicts what, what the Bible says in Ephesians. He couldn't flip open the Bible and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. First Peter, you know, says something totally different. They didn't have the New Testament. It was being written down. So there were people coming in that were bringing another gospel and Paul is talking about that. He says, my gospel, because he knows what's going on. There's a, there's a, uh, uh, a, a, a false teachers going along that are, are pretending even to be apostles. Look what he wants to the Galatians. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another. He said it's another gospel, but it's not like the one we're preaching. All right? Unto a heteros gospel. One that is not a different gospel. Which is not like ours. And he says, but there be some which would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. See, there's another gospel over here that's perverting the gospel of Christ. So Paul says, the gospel that I'm preaching is from God as opposed to the gospel that someone else might be coming in preaching. Look, in 2 Thessalonians, 
2 Thessalonians 2, Paul says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the gathering together uh, unto him, what? That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. Someone's come again and they're counterfeiting letters. They're pretending like they're writing from an apostle. It's a different gospel. It's another gospel. It is not my gospel. It's not the gospel that you heard from me. That's why he would say my gospel, not because he's got a special gospel over here that he's, that he's talking to the Gentiles, not because there's a special gospel that only goes to the Jews, but because it is a gospel compared to false gospels that were roaming around, <coughs> floating around, and leading people astray. And that's the same reason why Paul would say our gospel in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5. What does he say? He said, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So he's writing to these people saying, Look, you know our gospel. You know how it was delivered to you. Our gospel was confirmed with signs and wonders. It was confirmed. The word was confirmed with the signs that were following. Mark 16, uh, verses 17 to 20. He says, so when we're preaching, you know that it was confirmed with power as opposed to the other gospels that come in and no one can do these things. Same thing in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14. He says, whereunto he called you by our gospel. Why? Because the gospel that Paul was preaching as opposed to the false gospels are what calls you to God. Remember he said in Galatians 1 verse 6, we just read that. He said, I marvel you are so soon removed from him that called you. Who called him? Who called these people? God? How did God call them? By the gospel? But Paul says he called you by our gospel, the gospel that we're preaching as opposed to the gospel that someone else is preaching. Now see, friends, if you don't pay attention to the context and you don't pay attention to what's going on, you may take off this idea, well, Paul had a certain gospel that he's going over to the Gentiles. No, friend, no. Paul said my gospel, our gospel, as opposed to the gospel, as opposed to the gospels that, that you're getting from, from uh, false teachers or that are coming in and pretending to be uh, uh, teachers or apostles. Galatians 1 and verse 11, he says our gospel Our gospel is from God. I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me, his gospel, was not after man, for neither I received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, friends, if you're saying, well, Paul had a special, a special gospel because he got it right from Christ, well, hello, where did Peter get his gospel? Where did Peter get the gospel that he preached? Was it not from God? So you're saying that God has two gospels? He's going to have, a, he's going to have one gospel going to the Gentiles and one gospel going to the Jews? No, friends. God gave one gospel and it was given to Peter and Paul and any other inspired uh, uh, teacher or apostle. All right? It all came from the same source. But again, Paul is having to defend his apostleship. And the fact that his gospel is indeed from God. Because people are coming and saying, well, Paul preaches something totally different. I find it interesting that as Paul's defending himself against preaching a false doctrine, or saying his doctrine was not from God, then people today come along and take what Paul says and say, well, here's proof that he's got a different gospel. That's the very thing Paul's trying to correct, that he doesn't have a different gospel. The fact that he's preaching a gospel that was always being preached. It was the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 8. Again, the gospel, friends. I mean, just on the fact of that one little word, the, you have to understand there is one gospel. Now, if, if Paul and Peter are preaching two different gospels, then why don't you ever get that? Why don't you ever get that from the rest of the Bible? You go to Galatians, 6, Galatians 2, verse 7. 
And that's where you have something said about a, a gospel to the Gentiles, a uncircumcision, and a gospel to the circumcision. But in light of all the other evidence, you have to understand that must have just been a way of Paul speaking because there's no other evidence in the Bible about two different Gospels. It's just that Peter was primarily going to the Jews and Paul was primarily going to the Gentiles. Now, let's move on to another part of the viewer's question. The viewer says, If Peter preached the same message to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, why does Paul say this in 1 Corinthians 1.17? And we'll read verse, we'll read this. If Peter baptized and Paul was not sent to baptize, how could it not be the same message? Okay. Well, here's 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, really, if the viewer is thinking, they actually answered their own question. Look what the question says again. If Peter preached the same message, <clears throat> and that is to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> why does Paul say God sent Christ but to preach? Well, you've got Peter baptizing, and they're saying, well, Paul didn't baptize because Paul said Christ sent me to preach. Well, Peter's preaching. You've got Peter preaching. Why don't you have Paul preaching? If Peter's preaching and his preaching results in a message of being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, what was Paul's message? See, you're assuming because Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, that Paul didn't say anything about baptism. And that's just wrong. See? See? When Paul says Christ sent me not to baptize, that does not mean that Paul didn't say anything about being baptized. What do you think he preached? You think he didn't preach anything about baptism? I find that very interesting. If you read all the conversion accounts that, that uh, are connected with Paul, you know what you'll find? You'll find they all were baptized. Now, how did they come up with that idea? How did they come up with the idea of being baptized if Paul didn't preach anything about baptism? But just because Christ, was, Christ sent Paul to preach doesn't mean that Paul wasn't told to preach baptism for the remission of sins. Look, if you, read, if you read on, and this is what we're saying about context, if you read the context, listen to what Paul says. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 14, he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say I had baptized him in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus, besides I know not whether I baptized any other. Now here you have Paul saying, I baptized Crispus and Gaius, and then he says, oh yeah, and I baptized the household of Stephanus. Now, I don't know how many that, that is, but that's at least three. Now, if Paul says then the very next verse, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, did he disobey Jesus when he did baptize those three people? Did Paul disobey Jesus when he baptized Crispus and Gaius in the household of Stephanus? I mean, Christ didn't say not to baptize, did he? Isn't that what everybody says about everything else in the Bible? Well, he didn't say not to. Paul's over here baptizing people, Jesus. Well, you didn't say not to, Jesus. You just told me to preach. Well, he didn't say not to baptize. But here's why Paul did baptize. Paul did baptize some people, and here's why. Because Christ sent him to preach. And what, Christ, what Paul preached was baptism for the remission of sins. How do I know that? How do I know that Paul was sent to preach baptism for the remission of sins? Here's how I know that. Acts 9 verse 15 and 16 says that he was going to be sent to preach. And in verse 20, he indeed preached in the synagogues preaching Christ. Let's look at that. Acts 9 
Acts 9 and verse 15, Christ is talking to Ananias, and he's telling Ananias, you need to go talk to Saul of Tarsus. Why? He says, go thy way, for he, that's Paul, Saul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, and I will show him uh, great things he must suffer uh, for my name's sake. Now let's come on down to verse 20. <clears throat> when Straightway, Paul's obeyed the gospel. Notice this. Let's look. Let's look right here. Back up one. What happens here? Verse, six, uh, verse 18, And immediately there fell from his eyes as it were uh, been scaled, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. Now, Paul heard something about being baptized. We'll get to that in just a moment. But Paul was told, Saul was told he needed to be baptized. And then here he comes in the synagogue. Sorry about that. Verse 20. Here we find him in the synagogue, and what's he doing? He is preaching Christ. Straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, and that he is the Son of God. Now, what happens, friends, when you preach Christ? What happens when you preach Christ? Paul was, Saul was preaching Christ. He is preaching Christ. And every time you preach Christ, in the Bible, when Christ was preached, look at this. Acts 8 and verse 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. What did that involve? What did that involve? Acts 8. Come on down to verse 12. And when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now here's Philip in this Samaritan city. It's not a Jewish city. And he's talking about the kingdom. Now the viewer that's writing, my, that's writing his questions keeps asking, well, well, Peter preached about the kingdom and Paul didn't preach about the kingdom. He just preached about grace, the gospel of grace. And Peter preached the gospel of the kingdom. Well, here Philip is preaching Christ and he's preaching about the kingdom. He's preaching about the kingdom to non-Jews, all right, Samaritans. He's preaching Christ concerning the things of the kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. When you preach Christ, you have to talk about the kingdom and you have to talk about the authority of Christ, that is the name of Christ, and you're going to talk about being baptized somewhere along the line because that's what they did. They were baptized when they heard the preaching of Christ. Well, Paul preached Christ. Paul preached the same thing. How do I know? Because when, whenever you find Paul preaching, you find the same thing happening. People were being baptized. Now, friends, do you really want to say that Paul preached a gospel to the Gentiles in an effort to try to get away from being baptized? Because I can tell you one thing. If you want to take this two-gospel doctrine and say Peter preached over here to the Jews and he preached that they need to be baptized and Paul preached grace and he, and he didn't tell people they need to be baptized, you better check again. Even though you split up the gospel, guess what you still have? You still have baptism for the remission of sins being preached. You just can't get around it, friends. You just can't get around it. So even when you try to get around it, it comes right back and, and, and bites you. All right? So here's Philip preaching Christ, which is what Paul preached. Paul preached Christ. Paul was preaching what he had done. He was telling Gentiles what he had done. How do I know this? Stay with me. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 1, verse 16. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 16. You can put the phone numbers. Oh, you got up there. Okay, thank you. How be it for this cause? This is 1 Timothy 1, verse 16. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Paul said, Christ showed in me a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Paul was the pattern. So whatever Saul did is what everybody else was going to do. He was the pattern. You know, when you was in <clears throat> kindergarten, first grade, whatever, when you learned to write, you know, sometimes you had, the, you had those sheets and you got the lines and then you got those little dotted outlines of letters, you know, and you got to stay on those lines. You make sure your E's are just right and your L's are looped just right and, you know, everything's leaning just right and I don't know if they even teach cursive writing in school anymore. But those little dotted lines, you know, you got to trace those lines. You got to trace those lines. 
That's the pattern. And Paul said, I'm the pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. So if you want to believe on Jesus to everlasting life, guess what? You got to do it. What Paul did. What did Paul do? What did Paul do? In Acts 22 and verse 16, Acts 22 and verse 16, he was told, Why tearest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We already read he's baptized. This is the reason why he's baptized. He was baptized for the remission of sins, to wash away his sins. Now friends, if Paul was the pattern, if he was the pattern to the Gentiles, then all the Gentiles that Paul taught had to be baptized for the remission of sins. The same thing, by the way, the same thing that Peter said for the Jews to do in Acts 2 verse 38. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. How is it that Peter, talking to Jews, would tell them to be, repent and be baptized but the different gospel, the Gentile gospel that Paul's preaching is winding up telling Gentiles to arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. They sound very similar. Sounds to me like Peter is telling the Jews kind of what Paul is saying to the Gentiles. Yeah, you know why? It's kind of like because it's the same gospel, friend. The same gospel to Jew and Gentile. And that's why you just can't separate these Gospels. You just can't say there's two Gospels. You got a word from the Lord? Hi, James. I, I just want to call and uh, appreciate what you and uh, Caleb does. And I uh, hope a whole lot of other viewers uh, watch y'all and appreciate it too. All right. All right. Thanks for your call. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> now, friends, if I'm going to preach the Gospel, and notice what, Paul, what, what Jesus said. He said, preach the gospel. He didn't distinguish between Jew and Gentile. He didn't, he didn't distinguish between one group or another group. Look what he says. In Mark 16, verse 15, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now someone's saying, well, James, this was, he's talking about, to the, he's telling this to the, Twelve apostles, and they were Jews, so this is only talking to Jews. Really? Then why didn't he say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every Jew? Why didn't he say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every Jew, but leave the Gentiles alone? Now, the limited commission he did. When he was getting them ready for the, for the kingdom to be established, he said, yeah, you, you just go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You don't go to the Gentiles. But now he's saying, go into all the world. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, friends, if I'm preaching the gospel, the gospel, guess what? I'm going to wind up preaching baptism. You just can't separate the gospel from baptism. You just can't separate them. Now, let's move on to another part of the question that our viewer asked. The viewer says, why didn't you read the verse I gave you, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4? I waited the whole segment for you to read the about the gospel that Paul declares, but you finagled your way out of teaching truth. Well, you know, friends, I, I don't want people to think I'm finagling to get out of truth. But I think this, I think if you are trying to say there's two different gospels, one for Jew and one for Gentile, guess what? You're the one doing the finagling. Twisting is what finagling means. Being divisive and underhanded. All right? Kind of cheating here. Now, the gospel, the gospel doesn't need finagling. But I want to be, I want to be fair, so let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The gospel that Paul declared. Now, Paul declared the gospel that was the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. All right, let's just go ahead and read that. We'll come back to it in a moment. But let's, let's go ahead and read it so we're familiar with it. More brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Now, the viewer says this was Paul's gospel, the gospel that he was declaring, which also you have heard and received and wherein you stand. 
by which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I, what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Well, what did Paul preach? What did he declare? What was his gospel? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, all right, so here's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That is the gospel that we are told Paul declared. Now, friends, I know that Paul preached baptism everywhere he went. The reason I know that is because everybody that was converted by Paul, the Philippian jailer, the jailer says, what must I do uh, to be saved? Right? Sirs, what must I do? Acts 16, verse 30. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake the word of the Lord unto him, that were, uh, to, and unto all that were in his house. Now why? They said, Believe, but faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So they had to tell him the word of the Lord. Now when they told him the word, notice this, he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized. Now if Paul was told to preach, Paul was sent to preach and not baptized. Why, is, why are people being baptized? Everywhere Paul preaches, people are being baptized, even though Christ sent him not to baptize but to preach. Well, you know what? Paul might not have baptized this guy. But Silas was there with him. Silas might have baptized him as a result of what was Paul was preaching. So just because Paul didn't dunk them in the water doesn't mean that they didn't obey the gospel or that they weren't told to be baptized for the mission of sins. It just means that Paul didn't physically do it. But it doesn't mean that Paul didn't preach it. It doesn't mean that Paul didn't tell him to do it. So where Paul's, where Paul's preaching the gospel, the gospel that Paul's preaching, the death, burial, and resurrection, people are being baptized. So that tells me there's got to be a connection between baptism and the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ <clears throat> if that's what Paul was preaching. All right? Because if Paul preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, then he also preached the other, all right? So, now let's look at it. How are we going to find this connection then? How are we going to harmonize the two? How are we going to harmonize Paul baptizing people or preaching that they need to be baptized everywhere he goes while he's preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Well, I think the answer is going to lie back in 1 Corinthians 1. Let's start in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 12. See, we're still backing up from that Christ sent me not to preach verse. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 is where he said, Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach. And then we backed up a few verses and realized, well, hey, he's baptized Christmas and Gaius and the household of Stephanus, so he was doing some baptizing. But why is that important? Why do you need to preach baptism? All right. Why do, you, why do you need to baptize or preach people that need to be baptized? Well, let's look at this. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 12, Paul says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I of Cephas, and I of Christ. So there were some folks that were going around saying, Well, I'm, I'm, from, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Christ. And Paul says, Is Christ divided for you? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He says you all ought to be of Christ, not of Cephas, not of Apollos, not of Paul. You ought to be of Christ. But what does it take to be of Christ? What does it take to be of Christ? Well, think about it. Paul says if you're saying that you are of me, if you're of Paul, that requires, number one, Paul to be crucified. And then it requires people to be baptized in the name of Paul. Right? Let's look, look at the verse again. He said, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? If you, if you say that you're of Paul, then Paul had to be crucified for you. And you had to be baptized in the name of Paul. If you say that you're of Apollos, Apollos had to be crucified for you. And you had to be baptized in the name of Paul, of Apollos. If you were of Cephas, you had, Cephas or Peter had to be baptized for you, uh, uh, crucified for you, and you had to be baptized in the name of Peter. 
So what Paul is doing is he's showing us there's a connection between the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and being baptized. How do I know that? Because he said to be of Paul requires a crucifixion of Paul. Well, if you're of Christ, what does that require? It requires Christ being crucified. If you're of Christ, what else does it require? It requires you being baptized in the name of Christ. Whatever it takes to be of Paul is what it takes to be of Christ. So to be of Christ means that Christ had to be crucified, and we know he was. We know he was crucified. And to be of Christ means a person has to be baptized in the name of Christ or by the authority of Christ. Friends, you want to talk about the death of Christ being the gospel of your salvation, why does Paul connect it to baptism then? Why does Paul go around and say, well, you need to also be baptized in the name of Christ? See the connection? Christ was crucified, and therefore you can be baptized in the name of Christ. Now, my dear reader, viewer, this is what we're talking about. Here's the connection. The connection between the gospel that Paul declared, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, is tied to baptism. And here's why. 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and Romans 6, verses 3 through 7. And I'm going to put these up there parallel. I want you to look at the four elements of Paul's declared gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 and look at four elements that Paul talks about in Romans 6, verse 3. I even try to color quarter them for you. Here you have, notice this. I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Christ died for our sins. Romans 6, and verse 3. Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. The gospel that Paul declared was that Jesus died for our sins. And the gospel that Paul declared taught you had to be baptized into his death. There's a connection. Then notice, verse 4. Verse 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 4. And he was buried. Romans 6 and verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. The gospel that Paul declared, the burial of Christ, guess what? It also declares the burial of you and I in baptism into death. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, And he rose again the third day according to the scripture. So the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ that Paul declared, guess what he declares in Romans 6? Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Friends, what Paul declared, the gospel that Paul declared, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he was declaring it by talking about baptism where you die with Christ, you're buried with Christ, and you're raised with Christ from the waters of baptism. And here's the fourth element. Paul said the gospel that he declared in 1 Corinthians 15, he said the gospel that he declared, the gospel which I preached unto you is what saves you, by which also ye are saved. Well, look what he says in Romans 6 and verse 7. He says, for he that is dead is freed from sin. If you're dead to sin, you're freed from sin. Now what is salvation? Isn't salvation freedom from sin? The angel told Mary that Jesus will save his people from their sins. So here's what we're talking about. Here's salvation. Salvation is freedom from sin. And it's all part of the gospel. It's all connected to the gospel. Yes, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But it's connected to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ when you die with him in baptism, when you're buried with him in baptism, when you are resurrected from the grave of baptism to walk in newness of life, that's when you're freed from sin. That's when you're saved. Friends, you want to try to get around the gospel 
You want to turn around baptism by saying, well, Paul preached a different gospel. No, all you do is you run headlong into baptism. You run smack dab in to the very thing you're running from. Paul did not preach a gospel that says you don't have to be baptized for the mission of sins. He preached the same thing that Peter preached, and that is that all men everywhere have to hear the gospel, believe that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of their sins, and confess Christ before man, and be baptized for their mission of sins. Everybody, man or woman, Jew or Greek, had to obey the gospel the exact same way. You just can't get around it, friends. You can't try to make Peter and Paul preach two different things. It just won't work. Here's one more little note. <clears throat> one more excerpt from, from our viewer's email. Peter preached Christ, the Messiah, but had no idea of the power of the blood. Now, friends, all this tells me is that our reader has not read the Bible very carefully. And this is a very, very far-fetched, stretched effort to make there be two Gospels because they don't want to be baptized for their mission of sins. Peter preached Christ, but he didn't know about the blood. Peter didn't know about the power of the blood. Peter, a Jew, didn't know about the power of the blood. What do you think Peter, the Jew, had been doing all this time, all his life? What do you think he'd been hearing about? He'd been hearing about sacrifices that the high priest make, sacrifices after sacrifice after sacrifice, blood after blood after blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Hebrews 9, verse 22. You think Peter didn't know about the power of the blood? Well, listen to what Peter says. <clears throat> 1 Peter 1 and verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But what were you redeemed by then, Peter? <clears throat> but by the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot slain from the foundation of the world. Verse 20. Redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Peter didn't know about the power of the blood. You're saying Paul knew about the power of the blood, but Peter didn't? Paul knew about the power of the blood and then preached that you're saved without being baptized for mission sins? What? No, friends. Paul knew about the power of the blood. Peter knew about the power of the blood, and that's exactly why they both preached baptism for the remission of sins because it's in the waters of baptism in the grave where you die with Christ, where you're buried with Christ, it's where you come in contact with the blood. In Romans 1 and verse 5, uh, Revelation, excuse me, Revelation 1 and verse 5, Revelation 1 and verse 5, John says that Christ, notice this, unto him that loved us and washed us from our washed us from our sins in his own blood. Yeah, there's the power of the blood. Now you want Paul to be preaching a gospel that denies baptism? Well, look at this. In Acts 22, verse 16, Acts 22, 16, Saul of Tarsus was told, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Now I thought you were washed by the blood of Christ from your sins. Your sins were washed away by the blood of Christ. Why is it that Saul of Tarsus was being told to baptize, be baptized and wash away your sins? Because it's in the waters of baptism is where you come in contact with the blood of Christ. Like I said, friends, you try to separate the gospel and say Peter taught one thing and Paul taught another because you're trying to get around a plain command to be baptized for the remission of sins. But all you do is you run headlong into it. All you do is you come right back around and there it is, staring you right in the face. Friends, you can't, you, can't, you can't get around it. So even if you separate the Gospels, even if you say, well, Peter taught over here and Paul taught over here, two different things, 
you still can't get around baptism for the remission of sins. So why not just accept the fact that one, Peter and Paul taught the same thing. They taught the same gospel. And that gospel includes being baptized for the remission of sins. It's so plain, so simple, so easy. It's so easy. You have to have help to misunderstand that. Friends, we, we, we love you enough to tell you, you know, that you've been misguided. You've been headed wrong. You've been taught wrong. Why not accept what the Bible is teaching, the whole counsel of God? Why not accept what is being set forth in the Scriptures and just render obedience to it? Let the blood of Christ wash away your sins when you render obedience to Him in baptism. Friends, I hope this helps, and I hope that you hadn't. I hope you didn't say, "Well, you know, we've say, heard some of this before, and so it's getting tired." I hope it just reinforces in your mind the power of the gospel to not be broken. In other words, it doesn't contradict itself. It always comes around. It always comes together. Why? Because it's the truth of God's word. Friends, if we're gonna, if we can assist you in rendering obedience to the gospel, if you'd like a Bible study or some DVDs or you have a question, sometimes people just call up and have a question. Here's how you can reach me, 276-340-2653, word from the Lord at gmail.com. Be glad to answer your questions, take your phone calls, do anything I can for you to help you uh, render obedience to the, to the Lord. If we can uh, sit you in any way, we want you to do that. Come out and visit with us, have our Bible studies, like I said, on Sundays at 9 and 10. And uh, Thursday at 7, 250 the Boulevard is where we meet. And if we can assist you in any way, we want to do that very thing. Till next time, thanks for watching, and always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.